lesson for everyone, the craziness going on. But you know, one of the, one of the helpful things about uh, doing a verse-by-verse verse deep study of a book in the Bible is you get a feel for the author um, of the book you're studying. And, and as you follow along through the chapters, you gain insights into the way he thinks, into the relationship he has with his audience, and even into his personality. I'm getting to know a lot about this author here going through this book. And this is exactly what we get with the with the writer of Hebrews, because we really now have no proof of really who wrote this book, although there have been speculations of Paul, many will say Paul, or Peter, or John, or I've heard some say Luke, or John Mark, but whoever it was, was schooled in Jewish law and tradition, having exceedingly great knowledge of the Old Testament. But this is what we learned about the writer so far, in my opinion. First, there's no doubt, he was a pastor, mm -hmm. uh, an, an incredible pastor. He, 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 again, he knew his flock tremendously, uh, because his full attention was on his flock. It's like he's writing to his personal congregation because he truly cared for his flock's salvation, <laughs> not only their salvation, but seeing them through in their sanctification. Uh, he was also familiar with the readers. Uh, he knew their strength. He knew their weaknesses. He, he knew what they were being threatened of. He knew, he knew what they needed to hear. He also needed those, uh, those who needed to be challenged. He knew those who needed to be encouraged, those who needed to be uh, warned and those who needed to be rebuked, and that's really the audience he's been talking to. <laughs> but his main concern was that none of them would lose sight of what they gained, that they would not fall back into, into Judaism, in which they were once of, that they would, they would not give up on the free gift of salvation that is only in Christ Jesus, and no matter what happened, this mattered above all else. And that was basically the reason for this letter. And we saw his strong warning in last week's text, what would happen to those who would fall back into, Juda into Judaism. We saw that in verses 26 through 31. But let's read 29 through 31 and talk a little bit about that warning as we go into today's text. Look at verse 29. Uh, oh gosh, I'm out of place here. I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> he says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? And has outraged the spirit of grace. Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And I love the end of verse 31. He says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the writer throughout this letter also placed great stock in using historical examples. And especially Old Testament scriptures. As a matter of fact, in chapter 11 coming up, which you're going to study next week, he uses the giants of the faith, uh, throughout scripture, the giants of the faith and how they persevered. So he's, used, he's going to set the tone up for, and he's going to explain about using the examples next week. But here at the end of chapter 10, he turns back to the short history of this particular congregation which he was writing to. You know, we live in a society that thinks history is irrelevant. It's partly because it's self-centered. We only care about ourselves and, not, and our fragile feelings. Yeah, I don't know about you, but when I was in history class, when I was, in, when I was a child, we learned about the giants. We learned about the patriarchs. We used to dress up like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Now, I don't, what's happening now, they just they want to rewrite history today. They want to rewrite history. They, they want to tear down statues, which they've been doing. They want to rewrite our history books. They want to rename schools because of our forefathers, whom they say were cruel, because some of them were slave owners. Now, slavery is an absolute horrible thing. There is no question. It was legal, but it, being legal doesn't
doesn't make it right. But the Bible actually talks up quite a bit about slavery, but in a completely different way. Master-slave relationship back then was more of an employee-employer relationship. However, my point is, we wouldn't be the greatest country in the world if it wasn't for those who went before us. We would not. So instead of erasing our history, we need to learn from it. Good and the bad. And that's basically what the writer of Hebrews believes the same. He thought the past was a very important resource for the present. <laughs> Isn't that true? That's so true. Which is why he begins this text after that strong warning by using a word about bringing up the past. Look what he says in verse 32. Recall. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. No. <laughs> The first thing we should notice is the author does not recall his readers to pay attention to the good old days where faith was easy. <laughs> That's too easy. It's not the easy times that define our Christian lives. Can I get a witness on that? All three of you, amen. That's right. The really significant times, and I can testify to this, the periods that make up the highlights of our own history are the times of struggles, are the times of trials, and are the, are the times of difficulties. I know there's some people in here that can definitely testify to there are the times we remember. Times of hardship, of persecution and suffering are usually what remain fixed in man's, man's memory that define us, that define our faith. Well, people will say, I like to forget about the bad times in my life, but it's really impossible. We can. I, I've got some serious scars when I was a child of the beatings I've suffered. There are the things that just I always see in the memory. I don't remember many good times. I remember the bad, because they're the, that's, but you learn from the bad. And that's basically what the writer's point is, because it is in those times we learn. Even in early in my faith, all the struggles I remember, but I remember how God pulled me through them. And that's basically what he's going to tell these writers about. He starts out by challenging his readers with the simple question, do you recall the former days? And they would say, yes. You know what? I do. Pastor, I do recall those days when, when I got saved and I got baptized. But it was immediately after that I started getting persecuted. And this is, this is the group that he's targeting, the ones who just don't like the struggles. They want the easy faith. And because of that, and because of their early love for, for, for Christ, they were getting insulted and abused. They were losing their jobs. Some, they were losing family members to slavery. They were getting kicked out of their homes. Nobody to defend them. Much like we see happening in third world countries. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize the Christians that struggle in third world countries today that get absolutely no airtime from any ABC, from any major affiliate? Why is that? I mean, suffering. China, Middle East. Africa, Christians are being murdered every day, persecuted. You don't hear a peep. But the recipients of this epistle had experienced firsthand suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ, something they were not used to. Right? The Jewish heritage, the Jewish tradition was just a one big family human. But you know what? This text can also speak to us today because it tells us something about how we should approach trials when they come in our lives, and they will. And they will. Things happen. Circumstances suddenly change and a great problem arises. And we automatically think something terrible has happened. But has it? <laughs> you know, from perspective, we're bound to think this way in the face of marital problems, broken <laughs> relationships, financial problems, job loss, the death of a loved one, or this virus outbreak that just completely damaged many people's lives, both Christians and non-Christians. And it's certainly nobody's fault. Of course, we never look forward to these things, but you know what? As a man of faith, we need to prepare for these things. You know, here in Florida, we make preparations for the, for the upcoming hurricane season. Yeah, but we certainly don't make preparation for pandemics. We, we just don't. We just don't. Although there is a group of people, what do they call them, the preppers? Yeah. The preppers, yeah, they prep for like love bug season. These guys, are they're, they're nuts, but... but this passage reminds us that there are occasions that should cause us to rise up in our faith and our character and display the light of Christ in a dark time. That was the time. we got a world running around with their hair on fire, and we need to be a light to them. Yeah. But that's what I see is a lot of Christians <clears throat> catching their hair on fire as well. 
and just being just like the world. This is the time that we need to just be still and know that he is God. The times we will remember are the times of difficulty when God proves himself faithful to us. Even though the Bible says we're unfaithful to him, he is always faithful to us. Just like, the, who had the famous footprints in the sand? Yeah. Right in. That, that makes a lot of sense because it t tells you a whole story about walking with God and then there's just one set of footprints, right? Mm -hmm. But where were you in my hard times? And the end of the saying said this. It says, uh, during your troublesome and difficult times, when you saw only one set of footprints in the sand, is when I carried you. How true is that for those of us of faith? That is absolutely correct. Because the Bible says God is our rock, God is our fortress, God is our refuge, God is our strong tower during troublesome times. And I truly, truly believe that and embrace that. And we can testify to that. And that's what the writer's trying here to persuade these new Christians who are having a hard time staying faithful during their hard times. Because they're thinking, you know what, if I just go back, if I just go back into my religion where I didn't get persecuted, where I was loving God, or so I thought, you know, if I could just go back into that time, I could, life would be a lot easier. It's not, why is it with, and, and even some Christians, why is it always doing the easy thing? Because nobody wants to do the hard thing. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to pick up their cross daily and follow him. So they just they get kind of they back and what Tres says here in the text is they shrink back. That's a very dangerous position to be in. And I got news for you. It's not about doing what's easy, because that's too easy. It's about doing what's right and what's biblical. Because doing what's easy, that's not faith. That's certainly not trust. That's fear. And that's doubt. This is what the Bible says about the one who doubts in his faith. James chapter 1, verse 6. I love this text. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him, but let him ask in faith, with no doubt. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. Well, that's a person whose faith is unstable and will not weather any storm because he doubts. It's like going to God in prayer and praying and, and just thinking, well, he's not going to answer it. Then don't even pray. I don't know about you, but when I go to the throne of God, I expect an answer. And he answers every prayer. Everyone. No is an answer. No is an answer. But this writer wants his readers to remember that Christians can go through faith, that they're able to, just like they were in their earlier times. That's why I say recall when you were strong. Now, I think this is true, too. When you're newly saved, you're on fire. You can, you can weather any storm. You're on fire. But after a while, getting beat up got old for these people. I think that's what happened. They started, they wanted to, you know what, if I just go with the majority, why is the majority always right? Even today. Hmm. But I think that's what happened. They were on fire for the Lord. And I think they were one of the, one of the soils that Jesus talked about, about when, when you heard the word of God, you, you, you were excited until persecution set in. I think that's what these people were going through. He wants his readers to remember these earlier trials and how they endured through them and how, how sufficient God's grace is for those who looked at him in times of difficulty. And not only did they persevere in the earlier trials, they assisted in others. They reached out to others. Look at verse 33. He says, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Wow. These guys were on fire back in the day, weren't they? That's what he's saying. Recall this. What happened? What happened? Oh, did they beat you up? What happened? This also happens to Christians who isolate themselves from other believers. This is what scares me about this new church where everybody's on Facebook. Very impersonal. I'll, I'll be honest with you. In a month from now, it's going to be very scary because you're going to get comfortable in that position. 
That's why I'm here every Sunday, and a few of you are here. I mean, we're being saved. Yeah, absolutely, we're being saved. We're spread apart. I haven't been near my wife for 20 feet since March. I sleep in separate bedrooms. Right, yeah. But Christianity is a family affair. It's a team effort. And these guys were going out on their own, and they were struggling because they weren't getting the encouragement, and they weren't being an encouragement. They decided, you know what? I'm done with this. They just didn't take the beating. And this is also a pure fact that whenever a church begins to grow and develop, opposition can always be expected. Just read the book of Acts. Every time Paul planted a church, Satan would just bombard him. And that's what was happening here. The Jews were on fire and Satan hammered. And these particular Jewish Christians who were riding the fence, they were known as traitors to the Jewish faith and tradition. They became the main target of abuse. And in effect, they were treated as outlaws, as, as uh, aliens in a foreign land being totally deprived of legal protection. They had nobody to fight for them, really. And persecution was their lot. But to them, the Beatitudes of Jesus were especially meaningful when he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say, Blessed are, are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. I love how he throws that word in there. Falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So it's for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But, and here's the question, you know, I, and I struggle with this. What is it that Christians hear the most about suffering? You ever ask yourself, you ever ask yourself that question? And I'm kind of, kind of wondering what goes through other Christians' minds that kind of do shrink back. And I believe there's two things. First, will it ever stop? And second, will I give in so that my faith fails? Well, I'm here to tell you, if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the answer to both those questions are no. No, it'll never stop. And no, it'll never fail. It'll never fail <clears throat> if you are a genuine believer. And that's what the writer's trying to figure out. Are these people genuine? I don't know. That's why he's been just spending so many chapters on this one particular group of fence riders, I call them. <clears throat> Think about it. If the world hated Jesus, God in the flesh, it will not like you. Deal with it. And the closer you walk with Christ, ladies and gentlemen, and for you younger people, the more you will get persecuted by your peers, by your people around you. The closer you walk with Christ, the more you will be persecuted. When Jesus told Nicodemus, remember that he was the light of the world? He explained to him after his famous John 3, 6, 16 quote, he went on to say this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. <clears throat> Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the, in the name of the only Son of God. Here's the key part of what I'm talking about. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. And the reason why is, lest his works should be exposed. Four things. The world hates God. Darkness hates light. Evil hates good. And sinners hate righteousness. Bottom line. Bottom line. And because we live in a world now that I believe in which the prophet Isaiah warned about 3,000 years ago, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. <laughs> we are in that world. We are, we are in that world. But hey, however, it's never, it's not different. It's been like that really since the fall of mankind. It's just progressively getting worse. Progressively getting worse. So let's see some of the things that they suffered from. And the text says reproach, affliction, and their property was stripped. And yet, when that happened, according to verse 32, they endured. They endured then, but something happened along the way. This particular audience the writer is referring to has changed, and some started to become doubtful. Because in earlier trials, they stood fast and endured whatever Satan could throw at them. They stood side by side with those who suffered, for they truly demonstrated the love of Christ. This is what the body of Christ does in action. But something started to weigh on them. And the writer is trying to bring them back. 
That's what makes me, he's such a great pastor. He, he knew they were straying. He, he was warning them to come back. But you know what? There's coming a day. And, and you know, we talk about third world Christians. Uh, there's coming a day. I think it's going to happen like that in America. I really do. I think uh, what, what, what once was considered a Christian nation is slowly turning into a Christian hating nation. A nation that has turned its back on God. It will no longer be one nation under God. They're trying to change that motto for years. For years they've been trying to change that motto. I did an amazing, um, not study, but research on, on abortion, speaking of evil. Um, since 1970, there have been over 70 million babies murdered that were reported to the CDC just here in the United States. It's evil. And they're calling it good now. Bush is good. They applaud it. They exhort it. There's a political party that runs on it. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> I don't want to take off on that rabbit trail, but back to these struggling Jewish Christians who were considering leaving the faith because of persecution. These Jews knew the gospel. They were acquainted with the teachings of Christ. But that's no substitute for genuine faith. They had a profession of faith. Verbal. That's no substitute for genuine faith. A mere profession of faith is never good enough for salvation. It's not. They were on their way to believing, but they just had not fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they are, they are exhorted by the writer to recall carefully everything you went to, all the sweet fellowship with other believers, all the trials, all the times. You even got your property taken from you, and you rejoiced, you endured. Remember these times. That's what I mean. It's so important to remember our history, the bad times that we can learn from. He's saying, how terrible if after you've learned the gospel up till now, throw it all away because you had a bad day. Think about the apostles. Oh, my goodness. Think about the early church. We, were, we studied the book of Acts a couple of years ago. I, again, I'll say one of the greatest books in the Bible. I could say that about 66 of them. <laughs> Except numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but when I think about the early, but anytime I, I'm down, Anytime I feel defeated, we all do. I, I don't care who you are. You, you got to feel defeated sometimes. I think about the I think about the Book of Acts and what the, what the early apostles went through. They had they had absolutely nobody they could lean on. They didn't even have a church they could go to. They just had a few of themselves. To, to, and just, they just built each other up. They encouraged. They stood firm in their faith. Where would we be if they didn't stand firm? Where would where would we be if they shrunk back? back into Judaism, where they came from. Paul, Peter, and John, the pillars of the faith. Stephen even died for it. First martyr to die because he wasn't going to back down. He didn't allow his sufferings or his trials or, or temptations to overtake him. And who did he learn from? Peter and John. That's where Stephen learned from. So that's what he's saying. Recall Back when things were, when, when, when you relied on these pillars of the faith. That's why in chapter 11, he's going to go through the whole lot of them. Oh, it's going to be a great chapter. I, even Joe, and he wasn't an apostle, but man, he was a great example of what can man do to me? He can take everything, but he can't take my faith, my love for the Lord. You know, Sherry, Sherry lost her mom. And I saw a beautiful post she had on Facebook. And, uh, we prayed for them and, and, and Bill. And she wrote something beautiful on Facebook. And, and how she just, you know, this whole world is just a little platform. You know, until our reunion. And, and, and she's so right. This is, it's, it's a platform. But how we go through this life is what matters. But it's just, it's temporary. It's so temporary. And these little, these little ailments, these little struggles, these little uh, persecutions. Come on, really? Really? What's the worst thing happening here? Somebody call you Jesus freak? Ooh. Bible banger? Ooh. Really? There's people are getting murdered in other countries. Let's see them backing down. But 
you can almost, and this is what I love about this, right? You can almost feel the urgency of it. God, this is serious, man. You can't shrink back. You need to press on. And I get like that with some of the people in this church that I think are maybe on the fence. And I know by name, and I, uh, it's, my, it's my opinion on some. And they're the ones I'm just trying to urge it. So I, I, I feel his pain. Because you don't want anybody to fall by the wayside, especially as a shepherd. And I've seen some people leave this church, and it grieves me. Because I know some of them aren't going to any church at all. And it's sad. It grieves me. And I can see the pastor's urgency writing to this congregation that had one foot out the door because they were having a bad week. And he's saying, don't throw all this away. He's telling them, get the big picture. It's not always going to be this way. It's not. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to the that is to be revealed in us. I love that verse. So anytime you go through anything, just remember what Paul said. Be the apostle of suffering. He also said to his young protege, Timothy, about faith. Timothy, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. He said he fought the fight. He didn't say it was a bad fight, did he? He said it was a good fight. Because it is worth fighting for. Your faith, ladies and gentlemen, is worth fighting for. It is. Why? We're on the winning team, man. We're on the winning team. Read the end of the book. So why give up now in the middle of the game? That's what he's trying to tell these writers, these disorders. But they're, you know, they're, life is tough. Keeping the faith is tough in a world like today. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it is not a train coming. It is the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ waiting to call us home like he did Stephen. Because look at verse 35. He says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Oh, that's beautiful. Now he's saying, look at the think about these rewards guys are getting. These Christians needed endurance and patience to prevent their present circumstance from causing them to turn back and give up. Convincing them that their enlightenment in the gospel and their suffering, persecution, and loss by outward association with believers were not for nothing. None of this is in vain. We just saw that God will repay. Vengeance is mine. Your suffering's not in vain. God will pay back. God has a record of all those who abused you. Their confidence was not in vain, but it wasn't enough because they had not fully done the will of God fully because that's what that verse says. Because they have not trusted in Jesus Christ fully. They were, they were half in and half out, which means they were just half-hearted. God doesn't want half your heart, ladies and gentlemen. He wants you all in. Amen. All in. And until then, they could not receive what was promised according to that verse. Because he's saying that you may receive what is promised. They knew the promises, they rejoiced in the promises, and even suffered for the promises, but they had not received them because they were still on the fence of committing their lives to Jesus Christ. You know, churches are filled with people like this. Only half in. Only half in. They are on the negative side of Matthew chapter 7, which says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. These weren't doing the will of his father, in verse 36. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, they will not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from it, you workers of the lawlessness. So, so, so now I love what the writer does now. As usual, let me show you from the Old Testament scriptures that you have memorized. Look at verse 37 and 38. He uses a quote from the prophet Habakkuk. For yet a little while, he's talking about the promise, the coming one will come and not delay. He's talking about Jesus. But my righteous one shall live by faith. But if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. 
Once again, the writer is using the Old Testament scripture to prove his point. However, he did rearrange the wording to make it more personal to his readers. He's talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has been the point of so much of this letter's teaching, that when Christ went to heaven, he did not become inaccessible to them, but more accessible. Because he now acts as our mediator to God. Our, our great high priest that intercedes for us daily. That he spent three chapters, seven, eight, nine, on the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. And he's coming back to take back what is rightfully his, this world. He will rule what he created with absolute perfection. This is exactly what Isaiah talked about before he was born. He said, for unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and peace and of peace there will be no end. Finally, we get a government that ain't corrupt. <laughs> Finally. I love to support my president, I'll throw my Congress. <laughs> So this passage from the prophet of Acts gives a warning to remain true to God in the good times. And guess what, Mikey? In the bad, too. In the bad. No matter how bad it gets. Even the, pro even the prophet ended with a warning. Look what he says. If he shrinks back, God's soul has no pleasure in him. That's a strong warning to everyone. What he's saying is, you know what, this suffering, you might endure it, it's not going to last forever, but your salvation will last forever. Mm -hmm. Now he ends his text by pointing out two different classes. Notice how the Bible talks about just two different classes. <laughs> no matter how you got a thief on the cross, you want to believe, one to believe. Mm -hmm. But he says this in verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. This warning and appeal end on a positive and hopeful note. It almost seems as the writer is confident that those whom he is appealing to will indeed believe. Because notice how he throws, he didn't even, because he not only included himself, I, he included them also. Look, at, look how he worded it. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. I really believe he has confidence in this group. Mm -hmm. But he believes that because he has confidence in God. And he has confidence in Christ that God will save them. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of unbelieving friends and family. <clears throat> and I'm confident. And I keep praying. I've been praying for certain people for years, since I've been saved, 20 years. I'm still praying for them. Why? Because I have confidence that God will save them. Just as his writer has confidence that God will save this whole congregation. And so don't ever stop praying for anyone. Have confidence when you go before the throne with confidence to save that person. God, I was, after we have to see last week's warning, I would hate for anyone, including my worst enemy, which I have not, would go to hell for all eternity. But the very same God who ordained the end of salvation for his elect also ordained the mean by which he will get there. Everybody has a, a different path to glory. Some are harder than others. But this is where we get that beautiful doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Where John chapter 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You know, nobody ever said the Christian life would be easy. Jesus himself said it would be a struggle. He even said, Take up your cross daily and follow me. Christianity is not for the weak. It's not for the weak. It's not for the meek. It's for the strong. Peter knew firsthand what it, what, what, what it was like to suffer. He wrote this in his first epistle. I'll, I'll close with this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 10, I love this text. He says, humble yourselves. Therefore, don't forget, this was one of the most suffering apostles, Peter. Crucified upside down because he didn't even count himself worthy to be crucified like his Lord and Savior said this, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He says resist him, firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. See what Peter's saying? Every Christian in every planet, and every, not every planet, but every country, every county, every town will suffer the same as you. And he goes on to say, after you have suffered a little while, I love that. He says, just a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Hallelujah. And he answered, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, what an encouraging word, Lord. Father, we do not struggle like some of our brothers and sisters in third world countries. Lord, but you know, today we lift them up to you. Father, I've seen, the, I've seen firsthand the Christians in Haiti. I've seen it. I've seen the persecution they receive, and yet they have such hope, such joy. Father, we pray for Christians all around the world, especially in Asia and the Middle East and Africa where they are murdered for their faith. Father, I pray that they would not shrink back. Father, I, I just pray for anybody, anybody who, who even is hearing this message through Facebook or through YouTube, if you're half in, that means you're half out. I just pray that you would fully commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. I pray that you would receive him not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. Father, your word never falls on deaf ears, Lord, and we're thankful. Father, I'm thankful for those, Lord. I'm thankful for the congregation, Lord, you're keeping us safe from this virus. Father, I pray for all those, Lord. Pray that you would just guard your flock, guard your sheep. Pray for everyone in this town, Lord, that you would protect us. Father, thank you. Because even through these dark times, Lord, your glory is shown. But help us to be our help our lights to be bright in such a dark time. <clears throat> Again, Father, I just love you. We praise you for your word. We're thankful that we can meet together. And I pray above all, Lord, that you are honored and glorified in everything we said and do this morning. In the most precious name of our great God and King. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.